What's the upside of sentencing Sam Bankman Freed to 25 years in federal prison? If you've watched any of the videos I have covered about Bankman Freed, I have been hard on him, difficult. Criticized his inability to accept responsibility and continue to blame. Indeed, I will go through some of Judge Kaplan's statements in this live video, which will follow up on the message I gave yesterday. Is it in the interest of an enlightened society to sentence a 32-year-old to 25 years in federal prison? Many of you say yes and no. I'm going to offer my insights to someone who's been to federal prison, who's seen the pain and anguish that accompanies going to federal prison, including serving time with men who served decades in federal prison. And I'm forced to ask the question, in an enlightened society, is it in our interest to send him to federal prison for a quarter century? Yesterday, a prison guard in Northern California was sentenced to six years in federal prison for a violent crime where he sexually abused and assaulted women inside of that prison. A prison guard, a violent crime, six years. Six years. We've got to assess justice. Could we have achieved justice or fairness if he got five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years? And we could argue the reason he got 25 years was as a result of his own bad choices. Now, I'm biased, I know, because I've been to prison and we prepared thousands of people for federal prison. I believe sentences are far too long. We waste too much money warehousing people in these minimum security camps or low security prisons. And I believe those resources should go elsewhere. Poverty, homelessness, addiction. We're, this country is broke, yet we're going to warehouse this person for a quarter century. I'm already getting asked by media, how long do I suspect he'll serve on a 25-year sentence? Our team is bullish on prison reform. Worst case, we think 18 years in federal prison, which gets him out around 50 years old, still a chance to build a life. Indeed, he can begin to build that life in federal prison. I have said before, and some people call me insane and nuts, It is there. there is some value for Mankman Freed in getting clarity on his sentence today. Waiting and wondering is very difficult as a defendant. So even getting a quarter century while devastating and his parents were there in the courtroom and they're devastated and shocked and embarrassed and ashamed, at least they have clarity. Now, like most defendants who go to trial and lose and who will appeal, he will maintain hope that he will eventually prevail on an appeal. I don't even need to read what his lawyers are going to say in the media because, of course, they're going to say, we have a lot of grounds to appeal. We expect this to be overturned. This is a gross injustice. So that provides some hope to Sam Bankman Freed, even though there is a little bit of feels good to, to get some clarity I know from experience. What happens next now that he got a quarter century in federal prison? Well, if his goal is to get out as quickly as possible, he's going to have to begin making some better choices. And part of his problem has been bad choices he's made since he it was his name versus the United States of America. And all we have to do is look at the way that Judge Kaplan admonished him and spoke to him and all the bad choices he made throughout this process. You have the crime, and then he doubled down on the bad conduct. As you know, he had a terrible probation report. They asked for a century in prison. And of course, these guidelines are so massive and huge. You get this number out there, this 100-year number that, of course, the government focuses on. 100 years. We're only asking for 40, 50 years, Your Honor. That's less than the probation report. So you already have a a number that is very difficult to get much lower from. And the government asks, acts as if they're doing him a favor by asking for 40 or 50 years instead of a century, which is what probation asked for. But because he had a bad probation report, his post-defense conduct of getting taken into custody and a general disdain from Judge Kaplan put him in a position to give him this very lengthy sentence. I predicted yesterday in a live video I filmed that he'd get 15 to 17 years in federal prison. Here we are at at 25 years. And I, as we go through some of what Judge Kaplan said, it's, I suppose, easy to see. I'm going to cover some of those comments right now in a screen share. Then I'm going to talk about what happens what happens next for him. Here's the big problem. Remorseless Sam Aikman Freed sentenced to 25 years in prison as Judge Ripson is power-obsessed scammer. Judges don't like when you don't accept responsibility, when you blame and excuse and you have the government put your case to the test. So while they wouldn't tell you there's a trial tax, of course, he got a measurably longer sentence because he went to trial and his inability to accept responsibility. Sam Bakeman Freed, in my opinion, did something akin to what Elizabeth Holmes did. When he spoke, he spoke poorly. His high-priced lawyer who argued that she'd only get 63 to 78 months in prison should have scaled it back, should have stepped it back a bit and said, SBF, I know you have things to say. I know you want to convey to the judge you weren't selfish and you didn't have bad intentions, but if you're not going to have the right message, 
How about you say nothing? It's better to zip it than say things that are going to infuriate a judge who is already not a big fan of yours, but instead he couldn't help himself. Some defendants can't help themselves. They see the opportunity to speak and present to a judge as a sales opportunity, and because they have the wrong message, guess what happens? They get filleted and punished. They can't help themselves. Indeed, let's talk about some of the bad messaging, starting with how Kaplan responded. He did it because he wanted to be a hugely hugely political, influential person in this country. He knew it was wrong. He knew it was criminal. He regrets that he made a very bad choice about the likelihood of being caught as Bankman Fried stood in front of him with his hands clasped tightly at his waist. Of course, that statement from the judge belies everything that Bankman Fried said, which was, I made bad choices. I outsourced this to other people. I wasn't selfish. I didn't have bad intentions. Hey, everyone's going to get their money back. What's the big deal? Send me to federal prison for 63 months, which could have been fair and an appropriate number and in the interest of justice, had he pled guilty, had he accepted responsibility, had he done more to help the victims of this fraud get their money back. Indeed, he has only made it harder. And you can see that harshness and getting punished taken out on him today. Here's part of the problem with SBF speaking, and what, which is why his lawyer should have, that's a wrap, SBF. Thank you. We're going to talk a little bit later because you have Bankman Freed apologizing for making bad decisions that failed everyone I care about, but maintained his actions weren't selfish. That statement alone, we can spend days and weeks and months on breaking down, but suffice to say, it's the wrong message telling a judge you made bad choices and you failed everyone that you care about, but his actions weren't selfish. It's the wrong message at the wrong time. It's part of the reason the judge absolutely filleted him. A lot of people really feel let down. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry. Sorry about what happened at every stage. The fallen crypto mogul wearing light tan jail garb continued. I made a, a series of bad decisions. They weren't selfish decisions. They weren't selfless decisions. They were bad decisions. If you're going to speak in front of a federal judge who is appointed by Senate, appointed by a president, it probably makes sense for you to consider the stakeholders. So many defendants traversing this really wretched criminal justice system do not understand the stakeholders. A federal judge is cynical. Many of them were former U.S. attorneys. They view you for the crimes you committed, the bad things that you did. They are asked by the defense attorney to take the totality of your life into consideration. But instead, the prosecution asks them to judge you for those bad choices you made. And if the defendant doesn't give the arsenal or ammunition to that federal judge to judge you for the totality of your life, what are you doing? You're weaker and you're putting yourself in a position for a judge to absolutely fillet you. So it would have made more sense for SBF to say absolutely nothing. Indeed, there are some people who come into our community who cannot embrace the right message, which is why we say to them, if you cannot embrace the right message for a probation officer, for a prosecutor, for a judge, for a case manager in prison, for a probation officer who will oversee you on the other side of prison, who will your case manager in the halfway house, if you're unable to embrace the right message, say absolutely nothing. But as I said, some people unfortunately cannot help themselves cannot help themselves. I suppose the people who cooperated against SBF are, I hate to say it, thrilled because when you cooperate against someone and that leads to a conviction and a lengthy federal prison sentence, it leads to them getting a shorter federal prison sentence. They get what's called a 5K1 or cooperation letter from the United States government. So what happens next now that he's sentenced? There's an outside chance he could ask the judge to stay in that detention center in Brooklyn because it could be easier to fight his appeal. And I know for some people that sounds insane because just a few months ago, his parents wrote character reference letters articulating that it's dangerous for him to be in that detention center based on mental health issues and other issues that he has. And they would prefer that he be elsewhere, including not in prison at all, serving home confinement in their beautiful home in Northern California. So there's a chance they ask the government to, or the judge and the BOP to recommend that he serve his sentence in the detention center while he fights his appeal. Of course, the ultimate designation will be up to the Bureau of Prisons. On a 25-year federal prison sentence, uh, there's a very good chance, even with a 25-year federal prison sentence, that he goes to a low security prison. When he gets there, not sure, could be weeks and months while he endures what many people consider to be the hardest part of the journey. Thankfully, I never endured transit, but many of you might know my business partner and mentor, Michael Santos, who served 26 consecutive years in prison for a nonviolent drug crime. He went to prison at 23 for a nonviolent drug crime, and he endured transit over 20, 30 prisons across the country over 26 years. Many people in our community tell us transit, chain gang, con air is the most difficult part of the experience. And I've said before, 
once he gets to that ultimate facility, whether it's a, a low, I don't suspect it will be a medium, even at 25 years. I suspect the Bureau of Prisons with good time, time in custody, and it's in his interest, they're going to want to put him in a low security prison. It is a nonviolent crime after all. Transit will be very difficult once he gets there. I've said before, and some media think it's sort of funny. Once you get to that low security prison, it kind of feels like the Disneyland compared to that detention center where you're confined and locked up. It's a much harsher, harsher place to serve time. Where could he serve his sentence? I had predicted, because he lives in Northern California, that he will serve his sentence in a low security prison in California. And there are two low security prisons in California, Lompoc Federal Prison and Terminal Island, which is not far from my home here in Irvine. We've had dozens of clients over the years go to both. And some of you might find this surprising. Many clients who go to a low security prison who are ultimately eligible to go to a minimum security camp prefer their time in a low security prison for myriad reasons. There's more programming, more resources, better education, better health care. There could be more access to visitation. When you're in a minimum security camp or someone calls a club fed, which of course I do not agree with the phrase club fed, though I've heard it a lot since I've been in the prison business since 2009, a country clubs, people call it a smaller resources, fewer staff, fewer resources, fewer programs could be less visitation. Indeed, the highest value you're going to find most people find in federal prison and something that SBF is going to have to overcome is the inevitable boredom that accompanies imprisonment. In a couple hours, I'm going to do some live media, and I suspect they'll ask me, what's the biggest problem he'll have in prison? It's not going to be violence. It can be boredom. As the cliche holds, many people say it feels like Groundhog Day, and it can be very difficult for, for them to overcome the boredom. They're like waiting for mail call, like, oh my goodness, mail calls in five hours. The mail call is in five hours. Oh, I'm getting the New York Times in four hours today. Thank goodness. Okay, I have access to the email terminal in two hours. This is phenomenal. He will have access to email, by the way. I presume he'll write his book, which leads to how he will serve his time, in my opinion, in either Lompoc Prison or Terminal Island, where when he eventually transfers there, how will he spend his days? Pretty clear. He's going to be working all day on his appeal. He is maintaining hope that he will prevail. I have said repeatedly that there is a two-tiered adjustment to adjusting in prison, if that makes sense. You get sentenced, you embrace it, you endure it, you accept it, but you always maintain hope that you're going to prevail on an appeal. I presume that's what Elizabeth Holmes is going through right now. It's like Elizabeth Holmes got 11 years, SBF got 25 years. It's like, all right, I'm going to serve it day by day by day. I'm getting closer to home, but eventually I'm going to prevail on my appeal and I'm going to go home. If and when Holmes or SBF loses that appeal, what happens is the reality sets in. I got 20 years left, 23 years left. This is absolutely brutal. So if I were guiding him, and I'm not, though for transparency, our team is working with people in this case, though not him, I would embrace him to prepare. I'd prepare him to embrace the worst case reality. You were sentenced to 25 years in federal prison with good time, statutory good time, with the First Step Act, with halfway house time, and without additional prison reform, I would expect USBF to spend 18 years in federal prison, 18 years, which means you're out at 50 in the interim, build a life on the inside. So this 25 years doesn't feel like 250 years. You can be productive on the inside. And I would encourage him, besides working on his legal case all day, to avoid doing what so many prisoners do on the inside. They blame and excuse. They continue to blame and excuse. Indeed, I did that until I surrendered to federal prison in 2008. And then once I got there, it hit me. This 18-month sentence I have will be a life sentence because I blame everyone but me. This 18-month sentence is going to continue to create more pain and shame for my family. This 18-month sentence is, will not enable me to create a new career and pay my victims back, which I eventually did in full, though it doesn't excuse the pain and shame they went through before they got paid. If I don't get it together and introspect and examine how I got here, this will be a life sentence and this 18 months will feel like an eternity. I would encourage SBF to do the same exact thing and learn from others who have gotten through very long journeys. My partner, Michael Santos, 26 consecutive years in prison while there, got an undergraduate degree, master's degree. The dude would have a PhD or law degree if the board didn't the ward didn't block his books. He mentored tens of thousands of prisoners, including me. He got publishing deals. You should read his book, Inside Life Behind Bars in America, which chronicles his eight years in the penitentiary in Atlanta. He developed a network. He taught classes from prison, including at Princeton University. If someone serving 26 years in prison can develop a network and skills and improve the lives of other people, including himself and mine, it changed my life as tutelage. Can SBF, who went to MIT, who has support, friends and families, people standing alongside him, if Michael Santos did it at 23 in the penitentiary, can SBF do it 
at 32 with his support network and people standing alongside it? Probably, but it requires work and not happy talk. And he actually has an opportunity if he gets it together and at some point chooses to accept responsibility and say, I made some bad decisions, my bad, it wasn't selfless or selfish. If he can get to a point where he can say, in retrospect, I would have done things differently and I accept full responsibility, he could actually position himself to, it sounds crazy to some, some people call me nuts, I know, I've been called a lot of crazy things. He could become extraordinary and compelling that could compel Judge Kaplan at some point in the future to grant an early release from prison because of the First Step Act that the former President Trump signed in late 2018. And for those of you who ask if Trump is eligible for the First Step Act, the law that he passed, that's a big negativo. People say it's crazy that he could become extraordinary and compelling in prison. It's happened with others. Google the name Adam Clausen, who was sentenced to 213 years in prison for robbing banks. After the First Step Act passed, he was released after 20 years in prison thanks to the first step back that our team helped champion and pass in large part because of the journey of my partner, Michael Santos, who wrote Earning Freedom in 2008, which is about merit-based incentives. You should be able to earn your way home from prison. And that's the prison reform we hope is coming. Sam Bakeman Freed's days in federal prison will entail him working. And I'd encourage him as soon as he gets to, I believe, Terminal Island or Lompoc, he should immediately look for work. And that's a big question that comes up in federal prison. What type of job should he have? Anyone guess what type of job he could have? There are people that work all day in prison to feel busy, right? Like, hey, I'm going to work for nine or 10 hours in the warehouse or Unicor, which is like a government run program where you can make more money. People will work much longer hours for a variety of reasons. They may need the money, which I understand. But some prisoners who don't need the money, I made 15 cents an hour in prison. Some prisoners who don't need the money will work eight, nine, 10 hour days to feel busy, to feel as if they are not in, in, in prison. And the problem with that is they adjust in such a way where they're just serving time and they're not preparing for the inevitable obstacles that await the felon class coming home with a sullied reputation. Life is a convicted criminal a very long prison record behind you. So SBF is going to have to assess, does he want a job that's six, seven, eight hours away? Thank you, Vic. Do you, does he want a job that's six, seven, eight hours a day to feel busy? Or should he pursue a job like I did to be transparent that was 30 minutes or an hour a day? I did my job and people will come up to him and give him opportunities to, to do his job. People say, hey man, I will do your job for two or three books of stamps. Staff might not care. In higher security prisons, they ignore things like somebody else doing your job. They're more focused on real disciplinary infractions, tattooing, rape, things of that nature, iPhones, people escaping, real continued drugs and contraband and criminal activity. Higher security prisons, they are worried about continued criminal conduct. So things like someone else doing your job isn't a huge concern to them, frankly. For that reason, people will come up to him and say, hey, dude, uh, how do you feel about scrubbing toilets and showers? I heard you were assigned to the uh, to be an orderly. How do you feel about those toilet showers, man? They're pretty filthy. And uh, have you seen the showers here in prison yet? They're not great. In fact, uh, they're pretty filthy. How do you feel about cleaning them? You want to clean them? I wouldn't clean them if I were you. I'm going to give you an opportunity for three books of stamps a month. I'm going to clean uh, your toilets and showers. I'm going to do your job. And the irony is the people who he pays to do their job, some people that don't even do the, do the job and you can't turn that guy in. One, you don't want to do that in prison, tattletale on other people. But then what are you going to say? The guy I paid to do my job didn't do it. That actually happened. I saw that while I was in prison. So well, people will come up to him and say, I will do your job. He should contribute to that community. He should absolutely do his job, whatever it is. Now, he should look for a job that suits his interests. That could be in the library. That could be in recreation, checking out racquetballs. That could be working in the warehouse, gardening, horticulture, commissary. I went to the kitchen. Many young prisoners who were healthy go to the kitchen for the first four or five months. I did pots and pans, which I will tell you was a hard job, certainly harder than my time as a stockbroker. So the kitchen is a good job. Pots and pans serving food on the buffet line three times a day. Every other day, you get more access to food in the kitchen, which is something that I liked. Or he could become an orderly or other jobs. I will tell you, most people uh, who choose to not do their job and if staff doesn't care, staff notices. And if he wants to become extraordinary or compelling, he should do his job. He shouldn't complain. And he should do what we encourage, whether you're high profile or not. He needs to understand that he's moving into an environment where people have lived for weeks, months, years, and decades. And it's not in his interest to try to influence or manipulate this environment before he fully understands it. Indeed, so many people immediately get into trouble in prison because they don't understand the environment or they form friendships with people who 
that they don't really know who they're forming a friendship with. It could be someone that complains or has an iPhone or speaks to staff, which is a big no-no. And for that reason, you can become uh, associated with that person by staff and other prisoners, and it can, can look negatively upon you. I will tell you, some people convicted at trial who do not view themselves as criminals tend to associate with staff more than they should. Staff is law-abiding, us prisoners, people like me who plead guilty and break the law, or not. And for that reason, they could spend more time with staff. And that, of course, can be very off-putting to prisoners. So he needs to lay low and adjust. He needs to do his job. He needs to create a routine where he doesn't feel as if he's watching paint dry, which is how so many prisoners serve time. He needs to focus and work on his appeal. And there's ample time inside of these low security prisons to exercise. As articulated in my book, Lessons from Prison, these complexes look kind of like a junior college or corporate office park. They are massive. There's going to be a dorm with hundreds of bunk beds. There's going to be camp control, a place to visit, a place to shop in the commissary. There'll be offices for counselors. There's going to be several TV rooms, an email room. There's going to be a huge track. There will be weights. It's part of the reason that people call it a club fed. You look at that. Yes, somebody commented about pickleball. There may be pickleball there. Pickleball, tennis, softball, soccer, that track. Indeed, some people exercise 12, 13 hours a day, which is something I would not encourage him to do. Some people in federal prison adjust with exercise all day or TV all day, and they just adjust in ways where the time just goes by, but they're not really productive and they're not doing what SBF should be doing, which is how can he become extraordinary and compelling? Because if I were him, based on what Judge Kaplan said to him, and let's Let's go back to the screen share here for a moment before we wrap up this live video here in a few moments, right? So essentially, when you have a federal judge telling you you are remorseless, and he did it because he wanted to be a hugely, hugely political, influential person in this country, and he presented himself as the good guy, all in favor of appropriate regulation of the crypto industry, but it was just an act. So if you basically have a judge giving you 25 years in federal prison, what does that tell you? I can tell you what it tells me. He's got a great opportunity. Look, look, when you get sentenced to 25 years, you got to find some, uh, you got to find the silver linings, people. You got to think to yourself, okay, it wasn't 50, it wasn't 40, it wasn't 100. Our team's advocating for more prison reform. I don't believe in the interest of an enlightened society. He should have got 25 years. I think 25 or 50 years is worse than the actual crime he committed. We're going to warehouse and pay for him in prison for the next quarter century. Could we have done the job with 10 years or 15 years? Would that have made many of you happy who are still saying in this live feed that 25 years is still too short? Is it really too short? Do we really need to warehouse and spend all this money to maintain SBF with whom all of us will forget here in the weeks, months, and years for 25 years? Good God, of course not. That money should be spent elsewhere. But I know it makes so many people feel good to send him to prison for a very long period of time. But it doesn't change the silver lining that he has an opportunity to eventually convey to Judge Kaplan. Judge Kaplan, I've taken your remarks to heart. You called me remorseless, a criminal. And I've had time to introspect and think about the choices you've made. And rather than tell you in this first letter that I've changed, I intend to build a new record over a sustained period of time that proves to you why I'm worthy of an earlier release or a compassionate release or uh, an opportunity to have release earlier down the road. He should also share this message with his probation officer who's going to oversee him on supervised release for several years. He needs to inspire his friends and family who, while we will all forget about SBF and move on as we have done Elizabeth Holmes, all of the parents in the Varsity Blues case with whom our team worked with many. We're gonna forget about all Diddy sex trafficking. We're gonna forget about Diddy. We're gonna forget about SBF. We've forgotten about Holmes, kind of. Next time Holmes will come up on the radar is when she wins or loses her appeal. We are going to move on with our life. We love celebrity and stardom in this country. There's going to be the next big case that we're going to cover. We're going to move on. His friends and family will not, which tells me he not only has an opportunity to influence Judge Kaplan and work through his own efforts to show why he can create a new record, he can prove worthy of the love and support of his family who will serve this sentence alongside him for the next quarter century. For that reason, I would encourage him when he calls home to not complain. I would encourage him when he writes letters to discuss how he's finding meaning in the journey. For example, I would encourage him, we have a course preparing for success after prison course, which is a first step act to prove course. It's in the Bureau of Prisons. As I film this live video, hundreds of thousands of people in prisons and jails are going through this class that Michael Santos created. We're featured on the homepage of the Bureau of Prisons website. Probably a good idea for him to go through this class. Maybe he can teach it. He has a skill set. He has an education. Regardless of how you feel about him, he achieved something. He did things, many of us at least, things, some things I will never do or think of or 
regardless how you feel, he has accomplished some things. He should use his time in prison to somehow inspire and teach and give back and contribute. That is, that is how you become extraordinary and compelling. Back to his life in prison, because I know some people are asking, what would that day look like? I would suggest that he wakes very, very early in the morning, as Michael taught me. I started about four o'clock in the morning. Michael started about one. That was nuts. I started about four o'clock in the morning because it gave me, as it would give SBF, time to reflect and think, right? You're sitting in that dorm and he'll be in a dorm in a low security prison, right? You are fenced in. There's barbed wire there. You can't leave. You can't walk off like you can a minimum security camp. Okay. You can't, you can't do that. I mean, dudes walk off in the minimum security camp. They don't even stop you. When I was in prison, the guy walked off. They're like, Hey, where's Joe? He's gone. He hasn't been here for three days. They just let you walk off. You are fenced in in a a low security prison. There is the razor coil and barbed wire. You are in with a different sort of prisoner because you have a longer sentence. There are sex offenders there. There are gang affiliations there. So it would make sense that he really understand that environment. Though some people may admire him for going uh, to trial. They may respect him for not cooperating, but certainly there could be people asked, people try to exploit him, take advantage of him, manipulate him, uh, bring him things by way of the prison hustle, which he absolutely should avoid. But back to waking early, when you start early, you have time alone in that dorm to think and reflect. And I presume he'll spend that time reading, writing, and working on his legal case. Then in, in my case, around 6.30 in the morning, I went to the chow hall or dining room every single day. And he's going to need to go to the dining hall because you only have $360 a month to spend in the commissary. I don't care if you have 10, 20, $30,000 on your books. It don't matter. You can only spend $360 a month in the commissary to cover all of your essential needs, clothes, shoes, toiletries, food, right? So that 360 goes quick. So to ensure you don't spend all of it in one or two commissary shoppings, as I did my first month, you learn to spend time in eating in the dining room or the chow hall and there'll be cereal and some fruits and food that's pretty old and processed, but you endure it. There'll be coffee there. So going to breakfast in the morning is a good way for him to not spend all of his commissary limit. From there, I'd go back up to the dorm about 7.30 or 8 in the morning. Then I would go exercise for a couple of hours. And I presume for his mental health that he will spend several hours a day exercising. And there will be many opportunities there. There are fitness classes there. I saw Pilates, (laughs) stretching classes, ab classes pretty crazy. I know people get absolutely get a kick out of that. And people get a kick out of that. So after exercise for a couple hours, he will go back for what's called count. Federal prisoners are counted many times a day. In my case, it was 1030 in the morning, 4 p.m., 10 10 p.m., 1 a.m., 3 a.m., and 5 a.m. I had to stand for the 1030 and 4 p.m. counts. The other times I could be in my cube sleeping or doing something. I just had to be in there. So he will be counted several times a day. After that, count, then he'll have a lot of time. And this is what happens if you find a job that's only an hour a day. I mean, he literally could have all the way until that next count at 4 p.m. to do whatever it is he likes. He can go watch TV all day and complain. He can do some programming, no doubt. Programming helps you pass the time and learn. He should be building what we call and created a release plan that demonstrates what he's learning in prison, how he's progressing, how he's memorializing his journey, how he's being productive, sharing that with Judge Kaplan, with his family, with his probation officer. He should share with his prosecutor, with everyone to demonstrate how and why he's different. But between that standing count at 10 or 11 a.m. and 4 p.m., he'll have choices. And many prisoners make great choices like program, write, go to email and read and educate themselves. Other go right back to the TV room and just waste their prison term away. When I went back to after the 1030 count, my job was working in the kitchen for an hour or so. And then I would go back to the kitchen in the evening. And in between, I would be reading, writing, working alongside Michael, learning and preparing for my inevitable release and working to build this company, which is called White Collar Advice, which continues to prepare thousands of people for sentencing and prison and enduring all of the consequences of a white collar crime conviction. By waking early and exercising and doing your job and not complaining and feeling busy, it enables a prisoner to go to bed much earlier. And I can tell you an adjustment in prison, I know from experience, is the very it's light in there. (laughs) And if you're a light sleeper as I was, it took some time to learn to sleep with bright lights on and hundred dudes snoring and lockers slamming and the noise and the people clipping their toenails. One dude used to clip his toenails, like clip off and like fly right by you. I'm like, this is, this is dangerous, man. What are you doing? Get away from us. So it can take some time to learn to sleep in that environment. So the earlier you wake, the harder you work, including the harder you exercise, the easier it is to sleep because it can certainly take 
sometime. Also, people ask the virtue of waking early. It's nice to use the restroom and a little bit of privacy. He can get much healthier and fitter there by way of diet, or he can do what a lot of people do, which is eat ice cream from the commissary, a lot of cookies and donuts, and put, a lot, put on a lot of weight. I will tell you the healthcare unlocking, how do I put it lightly, uh, is a, it's not great. It's so-so. He probably won't get his teeth cleaned for a year. One way that we encourage prisoners to really advocate is their mental health needs aren't being met that if they're not getting medications. And that's something if he takes medications, you go to what's called pill call, where you are required to take the medication in front of the nurse. And that typically can happen 4 or 5 p.m., though it can happen several times throughout the day. One way I saw prisoners get into trouble was acting as if they're taking the medication, they put it in their mouth, they don't swallow, then they take it back up to the dorm and they trade for it. It could be a sleeping aid, they trade someone for it, that person gets caught, it's contraband, bad problems follow. People are asking, would he be eligible for a minimum security camp at some point? Yes. Michael started off in the penitentiary at USP Atlanta. I believe his case manager said to him, you will never leave the pen. But because of his release plan, his education, his adjustment and avoiding problems, he worked his way down from uh, the penitentiary to, I believe, the medium to the low. In the last 10 years, he served time in a minimum security camp. So yes, SBF got 25 years with good time. And for Step Act and other credits, he will eventually get to a point where he has less than 10 years to the door. And at that point, he will, I presume, put in a request to transfer to a, a minimum security camp. And the closest camp to his home in Northern California is a very small camp where Michael finished his sentence at Water Federal Prison Camp in Northern California. About 100 prisoners, a nice track, a very small prison. And of course, there are pros and cons to being in a big and small prison. I would say quickly, a small prison, it's harder to lay low. You have staff that's right in front of you. There are fewer prisoners. If you're engaging in a prison hustle or getting into trouble, you're gonna get noticed more easily because there are fewer people. And a larger prison like where I serve time that is now closed, there were 500 prisoners there. So you saw much more hustling, the prison hustle, contraband, things of that nature. Because even in a camp, there was one guard for every 125 prisoners. Even clients who are in a low will say there's a very small ratio of guard to prisoner. For that reason, it is very easy to it is very easy to get into trouble, but it's easier to not get into trouble in a higher security prison. People are asking about restitution. I will tell you, as I said in that live video yesterday, I believe Judge Kaplan considered that the lion's share of people may actually get their money back, which it appear uh, could happen. Doesn't mean there's stress and pain and shame and waiting. But at the end of the day, victims want their money back, and there's a very good chance they're going to get it. Clearly, Judge Kaplan wasn't swayed by that. Right? It, it didn't matter to him. In my experience, it's not as if if the victims get all their money back today, Judge Kaplan's going to call him back to the courtroom and say, oh, SBF, everyone got their money back. I'm going to sentence you from 25 years to 10 years. He could have factored that in at sentencing today. He could have delayed the sentencing to see how much money people actually get back. Indeed, people in our community have faced sentencing hearings. This happened with Judge Carter several years ago in Santa Ana where a client of ours faced sentencing. And our client said, Your Honor, I think all of the victims are going to get their money back. I need a little bit more time. And Judge Carter said, good. I'll see you in 120 days. Let's see what happens. Indeed, our client came up with money and Judge Carter gave him a shorter sentence. So because he didn't accept responsibility, because he's not selfish or selfless, yet he made bad choices, but because he doesn't accept responsibility, Judge Kaplan already considered this money is could come back. And he still gave him 25 years in federal prison, which again, I think is, I think it's absurd. I think it's a waste of money. I think interest could have been served for five, 10, 12, or, or 15 years. As I opened a prison guard in Northern California who sexually assaulted women in Dublin federal prison camp for a violent crime was sentenced to six years in federal prison. How do you feel about that? Do you think the prison guard for a violent crime sexually assaulting women should have gotten six years and SBF gets 25 years. I think it's distorted. I don't think it's fair. I think it's absurd. And as I mentioned yesterday, because people don't really understand the collateral consequences of mass incarceration or the cost of it, people just say, lock them up, throw away the key without recognizing the longer we expose people to corrections, the worse off we are, the broker our country will become. And the job could have been accomplished to 10 years, 15 years, even 20 years. But I see no interest in sending SBF to federal prison for a quarter century, even though I've been critical of him in the past. People are asking about other people in this case. 
I, I can articulate to you, well, Caroline, get me time. I can't predict the future, though. I will tell you because others have cooperated, accepted responsibility, assisted the government in catching cases, which is, of course, what they love. They love nothing more than catching cases and further in their career. Because of that, I would expect all of these defendants to get measurably shorter sentences. And you can also argue they've earned it, right? It's one thing, as I say, to make a bad decision. It's another thing to say, how do you respond to that decision? So in federal prison, you hear these snitches get stitches and all this ridiculous prison parlance that means very little in a camp. It means a little bit more in a low because someone could check you and ask you if you cooperated. SBF did not, but all of the other defense in, in defendants in this case, if they get sentenced to prison, it will be a camp. But because of their response to their bad choices, they have earned the right to get shorter sentences. They have accepted responsibility, had good post-defense conduct, assisted the government as much as some people don't like that. And of course, their conduct was measurably less than SPF. So I don't know what the sentences are going to be, though I can tell you it ain't going to be 25 years in prison. And we also have to understand at some point it's never going to be enough for, for some people. I have a, a large larger presence on TikTok, do white collar, have YouTube here, and I do some media and things like that. And every now and again, I'll, I'll get some messages from people who will say 10, 20, 30 years is, is, is never enough. When is it enough? People commenting, I am upset the political donations didn't get to go to, to trial. That was more important. Why? Did, should you get 30 years, 35 years with the political donations? They, they, what, what's the upside of that? Do you want to spend more of your tax dollars warehousing him for 30 years instead of 25? I don't. I live in Orange County now. I grew up in Los Angeles. When I walk to, when I go through Los Angeles for business meetings, you know what it looks like? Gotham City. The city should be torn down. It's broke. It's sickening. It's dirty. The homelessness, the poverty, I'd love to see resources go there rather than warehousing SBF for a quarter century. But I recognize for some people it will never be enough. We also have to address uh, people's feelings when they say things that just aren't true. Like people, I'm getting text messages here, but he got 25 years, he'll be out in five. Well, how? The only way he'd be out in five years follows if it takes five years for his appeal to come through and he wins and he gets a pardon or commutation from the president of the United States. Or if somehow, some way, Judge Kaplan feels he's extraordinary and compelling based on the record that he builds, that even if he does, it's unlikely that it would happen within five years. It has to be built and sustained over a very lengthy period of time. And that's another thing that that's hard to do, right? It's very hard to build and create and memorialize while you're in, while you're in federal prison. I know it was hard for me. I was there a measly year. I saw my partner do it every day. And you're going to find a lot of people have high hopes and aspirations when they go to prison. And then you get there and it's like the pestilence of prison sets in and you feel like the enmity, the, the hatred from staff and prisoners is very hopeless environment. And for many, it's just, they just succumb. They give in and they rationalize that it will never end, that this is a life sentence and, and life habits form quickly. And if he gets into a habit in prison of complaining, excusing, focusing only on his appeal and not finding a way to contribute and give back, it's going to feel like a long sentence. And his friends and family will see it when they visit and when he calls home. And I would remind him this experience will be harder on them, harder on his friends, really harder on his family, who I, I'm sure endure a great deal of pain and shame for where he is. It's difficult. I served 18 months in federal prison. It was devastating for my parents who blamed themselves. I can only imagine what they're feeling and enduring. People ask, can he write a book in prison to sell when he gets out? Somewhere in my office here is my book, Lessons from Lessons from Prison, that any of you can get for free at White Collar Advice. I'll even send you the audible version if you like. Certainly he has the opportunity. He has an opportunity that very few people have. And this is something he needs to embrace. And if I were guiding him, I'd say, yes, it's a long time. People have overcome it. People have endured it. Learn from them. If they did it, so can you. And look at those who have built successful journeys around their prison sentence. My partner, Michael Santos, did 26 years. He's probably written 50 books. He does advocacy work, leads Prison Professors Charitable Corporation, does work with the Bureau of Prisons. Every California prison uses his work. He served 26 years. Came home, taught at San Francisco State. Kind of a big deal. It's impressive. How did he do it? He worked every single day. Jordan Belfort served a much shorter sentence, but look at the business he's built around his experience. Frank Abagnale, a mentor to me when I came home from prison, Catch Me If You Can, played by Leonardo in that wonderful movie, wrote a great book while on the inside. In my small world, Lessons from Prison, my book helped me build a career focused on how white collar defendants can prepare for sentencing, be productive in prison, really life, live a life of meaning despite a stained 
reputation or solely reputation of having gone to prison. So absolutely, I would encourage him to write aggressively, voraciously every single day and build a record. And there are myriad ways that he could write. He can write via his blog. I maintained a blog in federal prison where I would write it, send it home to my mom, and she would put it on my website. I did it in prison without email. Email came about a year after I left prison in 2009 or 2010. So think about that for a moment. He can write a blog every single day. Now, there's upside and downside to writing blogs, right? It is a high-risk, high-reward activity. And we talk a lot about this in our training on the quadrant theory. High-risk, high-reward, low-risk, high-reward, and so on. It's a high-risk, high-risk, high high-reward thing if SBF were to write. It's high-reward because he's writing and documenting his journey. He puts it online for the world to see. His judge can see it potential movie, you know, producers can see it, his friends and family, people who have a vested interest in his success can see his growth through prison. It's high reward to document the journey. It's also very, very hard because it requires work. A lot of people in prison will say they read hundreds and hundreds of books, which is great. It's a passive activity. You ask them why they read the book and what they learned from it and how it will help them moving forward. They can't tell you. That's kind of a passive activity. You might as well be watching a movie. So what we would encourage him to do, and some people knock me for this. In fact, one guy sent me a text message that said, dude, you sound like an imbecile. What are you in the third grade writing a book report on Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory? Yes, I am. Thank you. We encourage people who read books to read to write a book report. What did you learn from it? How will it help you in prison? How will it help you moving forward? He can put that out there for the world to see and really show his growth. The downside is it's a little higher risk because staff could be reviewing it. Other prisoners can get a hold of it on their iPhone, of which there will be hundreds of illegal iPhones in that prison. And they could question, why are you writing? Why are you bringing attention to how you're serving time? Why are you bringing attention to how productive you are? My girl's reading your blogs and she's asking me why I'm not doing that. I, don't, I had that problem while I was in federal prison while people were beginning to read my blog. Didn't matter for me because I only served a year. And when people caught on, I was almost going home. He's got 25 years. But I know Michael documenting the journey every single day through his blog brought myriad opportunities. It brought meaning to his life and tens of thousands of people. He's in a position to provide hope to people traversing the system, sharing insights on what he's learning and how he's becoming productive. He has an opportunity to use his platform for good, as Belfort did, even if you can argue he just went out to make money and sell his programs. Frank Abagnale does a great job educating companies on credit card fraud and how to undo it. When I came home from prison, I traveled the country lecturing to businesses and universities on white collar crime. I've been to the FBI Academy, USC, my alma mater, Stanford, businesses, KPMG, Wells Fargo, helping them understand the collateral consequences of cheating. And now I run a consulting company that leads the country helping people. So you can find meaning, you can build and create while you're there. And our team is continuing to advocate for more prison reform, like the First Step Act we helped pass. So that's another opportunity. What if more prison reform comes? He could be out of there in 10, 12, 15 years. Well, what if that prison reform is merit-based, which is what we think prison reform should be? More people should be able to have work furloughs where you go out in the community to work, you can go back to the prison. Right? You should be able to earn merit. We think parole should come back. That was abolished in the 80s. You go in front of a parole board and you demonstrate to a parole board why you're worthy of an earlier release. Wow. Imagine if he goes to a potential parole hearing with his book that isn't about being, I wasn't selfish or selfless. My bad. I didn't mean to do it. I wasn't greedy. Y'all got it wrong. That's the wrong message, similar to the wrong message he just gave to the judge this morning, which is part of the reason he got filleted with a quarter century, which is why his lawyer should have said, that's a wrap, SBF, sit down. So he has major opportunities if more prison reform comes because we've interviewed subject matter experts who tell us if prison reform comes or if a candidate's eligible for earlier release, who's going to give it to? Well, how, does, how do things work in life? It tends to, we tend to get rewarded if we do the work, right? right? There, there, there's no like shortcuts. If you do the work, you tend to get more of what you want. It's very simple. We want it to be the same way in prison. You should get treated one way if you watch TV and complain all day. You should get treated a different way if you memorialize and document the journey and provide value to other people and contribute. Those are our thoughts, at least. And if he can do that and build and memorialize, a parole comes back or if he positions for an early release, a compassionate release under the First Step Act, because he's extraordinary and compelling, he has a higher likelihood of succeeding if he's done the work. But what happens sometimes is like people start. <laughs> they start to do the work and then they stop. It's akin to some people who might start exercise and you see a little bit of progress and you stop. The real work is doing the work on days you don't want to. And that's kind of the key to prison as I get ready to wrap up this live video, because I'm gonna do some live media here in a little bit. The key to thriving through prison is recognizing at some point it's going to end, creating a record and new habits that help you feel productive. 
knowing that it's possible to live a life of meaning and relevance in prison. And I saw that through Michael, but it's hard. It requires doing work on days you would rather do just about anything else, because it's one thing to say you're going to write a book or you're going to memorialize your journey. You're going to teach. It's another thing to actually do it. It's another thing to say you're going to not just read books, but write book reports. He should be contributing to business schools and curriculums all across the country. And people call me crazy for that, too. But here's the thing. If I did it, why can't he? Nobody knew me. Nobody knew me. I went to prison for a year. But you know what Michael Santos encouraged me to do while I was in prison? He said, why don't you ask your mom, who is serving the sentence alongside you, to send you the names of 20, 15 to 20 business school professors across the country. Why don't you just write them an unsolicited letter? In fact, I'll help you write the letter. Let's go to the library, write the letter. The warden had blocked off the typewriters. We couldn't use them in case you had a pending appeal. Let's hand write a letter, 15 to 20 universities across the country. Let them know you'd love to contribute to their curriculum on ethics and white collar crime. Okay, we did it. No one responded. And I would go into Michael's cubicle and I'd say, man, nobody responded. That's okay. You're just serving time here one day closer to home. Let's write another letter. The worst thing that happens is nothing. At least we have the dignity and experience for having tried. I'm like, cool. We write another letter. Nothing happened. Guess what? We wrote another letter. We wrote another letter. And eventually I got a letter from Kelly Pope, a professor at DePaul University in Chicago, who said, Justin, thanks for your letter. We love your blogs. We read them every day in class. In fact, when you get out of prison, can we pay you to come to Chicago and tell your story? I'm like, what's happening here? By the time I wrote her back, she had sent me another letter that said, not only do we want you to come and speak when you get out of prison, we've gotten permission from the warden. We're going to come and film you. And on my White Collar Advice YouTube channel, you'll see a movie that was put up, a movie that I contributed to and filmed from a low security prison in 2009. I had much more hair then. I was nervous when I did it. The point is, if I can write a letter with Michael's help from prison and nobody knew me, look at the opportunities that SBF has. If he truly wants to be selfless or altruistic, which he claims to be, he should, with the help of his family, tell 100 business schools, 200 business schools, I want to help you. In retrospect, here are things I could have done differently. And I know he'll have more leeway to do this if and when he loses his appeal. But even now, there are lessons that he could share, lessons to convey people that he can actually help. I think it feels good to help people. It's a way to find meaning through the journey. It's a way to give back. It's a way to not feel as if you're serving time, but rather the time is serving you. He could write these business schools and let them know that he'd like to contribute and just help answer questions. He's a movie star. He's a rock star to these people. Billionaire, Tom Brady. I mean, come on, man. If I did it and nobody knew me, imagine the opportunities that he has. And I hope he doesn't waste this opportunity because as I said earlier, for, we all get forgotten about. Homes, forgotten. SBF, forgotten. P. Diddy will be forgotten. Varsity Blues parents, forgotten. We move on to other cases. He's got to learn how to use this experience. Guess what? This is his best remaining asset. His experience with the criminal justice system. My best asset was my experience with the criminal justice system because I learned to use it to help people. Those are things that he needs to do. As I wrap up this, uh, video. I want to see if I'm going through. There's been a lot of comments here. I'm I'm really great. People commenting on Trump and the First Step Act. I'm grateful that President Trump signed the First Step Act, which was, of course, uh, really pushed and promoted by Jared Kushner, whose father served time in prison, indeed prosecuted by Chris Christie. So I'm very grateful the former president signed the First Step Act. We think it's just a first step. We want to we want more prison reform. We want to continue to incentivize excellence, that you should earn your way home rather than, as Michael Santos has written since 1987, calendar pages turning. People ask him, why did Sammy get 25 while Elizabeth Holmes only got 11? Riddled me that. There are myriad reasons. The loss amount, I don't believe the loss amount for Elizabeth Holmes was 10 to $14 billion. That's a, that's a really big number. The victims, you could argue, in Elizabeth Holmes' case were more experienced, wealthier investors. And even the government could argue there might have been more culpability, the fear of missing out. People were investing without perhaps doing their full due diligence. So the cases are, are absolutely not the same. But it, I can understand why some people would say, you know, why would she get 11 years and he would get, he would get 25 years? I think, um, I think that's a wrap, people. So here's how I'm going to close. I'm going to close this 50-minute live video with how I opened. There should be consequences if you break the law. There should be consequences if you don't accept responsibility. But in an enlightened society, how long is too long?
I think a quarter century is actually worse than the crime he was alleged to commit. 50 years, I feel the same way. We could have had the same amount of justice, deterrence at 5, 10, 15 years. I truly believe that. And I want you to think and consider as we all go on with our day. A prison guard in Northern California was sentenced to six years in federal prison for a violent crime of sexually assaulting women in prison. Six years. SBF got 25 years in prison for a nonviolent crime. How do you feel about that? Do you think it's fair? I don't. We could have had justice. We could have had deterrence. Could have had continued consequence. Not at 25 years. Not at 20 years. Not even at 15 years. Could have been much less and we'd have had the same result. Thank you so much for joining the White Collar Advice community. Again, please like and subscribe. I'm 50 minutes into this. I'm supposed to say that at the beginning, but I just want to get into content to providing value. If you find value, like and subscribe. If any of you would like a copy of Lessons from Prison, please visit White Collar Advice. And if you have interest in prison reform and learning more about the ways that we're educating and training and helping hundreds of thousands of people in prisons and jails, I am, and encourage you to go to prisonprofessors.com where we give away tons of free resources for people who can't afford to retain white collar advice, but we have a treasure trove of content, books, courses, blogs, videos, podcasts, all geared towards helping people traverse this really wretched system. And I'm proud to say white collar advice, the company that I co-founded with Michael is the biggest sponsor of prison professors. So if you care about prison reform, you care about incentivizing excellence, you want to get vested and involved, we'd love to chat with you. If not, I'm grateful that you're here. I hope all of you have a wonderful day. Thank you for letting me share my insights on FBF sentencing from my perspective as a former federal prisoner and now consultant who with my team has guided thousands of people through the system. I wish you all well. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.